thank you very much. And I hope you all had a, a nice lunch. Um, I'm going to, if I may, just share some thoughts with you. Um, when I arrived and I saw that uh, the theme was, or the stream was, was home care, I was slightly worried because I'm not really talking about home care, although there may be some areas that are um, useful and applicable. Um, I'm not sure about you, but when I go to one of these sort of events, I try to come away with, um, with three things. I try to learn something. I try to be challenged in terms of my own thinking. And I try to come away with at least one business contact. So if at the end of this session, you haven't learned something, you haven't been challenged in terms of your thinking, our stand is right next door. So at least leave your business card so we can at least make a business contact and you haven't wasted uh, half an hour of your valuable time. Um, as I said, what I'd like to do is just kind of share some thoughts with you really and offer a proposition, no more. And perhaps rather than take questions at the end, maybe spend two or three minutes getting some feedback from you as to whether my thinking is somewhere close to your thinking or the whole thing makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, that's okay. You can tell me that as well. For those of you who don't know about Avanti Partnership, the slide tells you a bit about what we do. We are a Kent-based charity. We provide a range of uh, services. We have a portfolio of 15 care homes. We provide domiciliary and home care for people with dementia in the main. And we also support people with disabilities and children, young people and families. I'm very, very fortunate to work with almost 2,000 of the most wonderful people I've ever met. Um, our staff are amazing. They do a fantastic job in very difficult and challenging circumstances. And I guess it's those circumstances that have made me start to think perhaps slightly differently about what we should be doing. I think all providers, commissioners, carers, and others would really talk a lot about, or want to talk about personalization or person-centered care. I want to talk about person-centered care, this idea that the services that we run are about as person-centered as we can make them. It's user-focused. We put the individual at the heart of what we do. We really promote independence, even within a residential care setting. We try hard to do that. People talk about choice, and I think there's some limitations around choice at the moment, especially for those people whose care and support are funded through local authorities in the main, and is offered to those working in a collaborative uh, team philosophy. And this is from the uh, Joseph Rauchy Foundation, and um, I think most people would agree to that in, in principle. Within Avanti, what we try to do, and I, I talk about try because I've been in working for Avanti now for just over four years, and I think that we have, as an organization, we really struggle on a day-to-day -day basis to deliver exactly what we say. I'm here to be honest, I'm here to be transparent, and that is the case. What we try to do is value the people that we care for and support, and we do that. We work hard to support people as individuals, although certainly residential care services, when you're running a very large residential care home, we have one home with 120 beds. It's actually quite difficult all of the time to do that. We work hard to see the, the world from the person with dementia's perspective. And that's through our recruitment and our training and our mentoring and our meetings and our briefings and the people that we work with. And we also provide a social environment that we hope supports people's psychological needs. We have a very... So what's interesting, of course, is the reality sometimes is not quite like that. I found this quote from uh, Dawn Brooker. It was written when she worked at the University of Bradford, but she now works at the University of Worcester. And it's interesting that uh, for some, you, you may recognize this. You may recognize the fact that despite every effort that we make as providers and, and, uh, and carers, it's a real challenge. Dawn talks about the uneasy knowledge, and it is uneasy. 
that the lived experience perhaps may not always match what we say, despite all of our efforts. As an organisation, about three, four years ago, we adopted a philosophy of care. We wanted to ex express very clearly and explicitly how we want, how we believe care and support should be delivered. So we have committed ourselves to working, developing a philosophy of care that's based on the Eden Alternative. I don't know how many have heard of, of, of Eden and the Eden Alternative, but it's based on, uh, on the work of Bill Thomas in America. And as an organization, it's something that we work, we're working hard to do. And we talk about people who are in receipt of care also being caregivers themselves. We talk about spontaneity in our care services. We talk about the importance of children, of nature, of pets in our, in our care homes, be that dogs, cats, whatever it may be, right across our services. We have four of our homes that are Eden accredited and we're working hard to ensure that the rest of our homes are Eden accredited. There is a link there for those people who are interested in Eden and we believe that as an organisation, this will be the glue that binds us together right across our services. As I mentioned, this is what we aim to do, this is our ambition, this is what we're working hard to do, but to be frank with you, we are living in a reality. And it's a reality that many providers may well understand. It is a reality where there is, in our care homes and services, across our domiciliary care services and home care services, there is a lack of time. Staff tell me, we see, we witness how hard staff are working, and the reality for those members of staff is the services have changed. At one point in time, residential care services was not as challenging as they are today. The care and support of people in residential care was not about people with very, very complex dementia and support needs as it is today. There are issues where homes are service rather than user-led. As I mentioned, in a very large care home, in the end, with all the challenges that staff and managers face, sometimes the service runs itself and we have to keep reminding ourselves about the importance of the individuals within those care services. Whether we like it or not, the level of bureaucracy in our services and across our organisations is significantly greater now than ever before. The amount of paperwork, evidence, collation and so on and so forth, very, very challenging. We haven't had the resources to invest as much as we would like in uh, technology in terms of care planning and the like, but it's a real challenge. The amount of hours that staff spend during the day writing up care plans is a real challenge. Budgets are getting tighter and tighter. There's less and less financial wriggle room within our services, within our organisation, and that's a, that is a reality that we are facing. There's no question about that. Commissioning we understand the pressures that commissioners are under. We understand how difficult they're having it right now with their funding problems. And that's been transmitted, that's been translated through to us as providers. And I think it's fair to say we still struggle as an organisation, not everywhere, not every day, with staff who are very committed, who love their job, but they are very task orientated. Many of our staff have been employed by us for 20, 30 years and perhaps were part of a regime that was very much task orientated. I would not say for a moment that our staff don't care. Our staff care passionately about what they do, but for us, the challenge is to support our staff to make a paradigm shift in how they think about delivering care and uh, support. So this is our reality as an organisation. I don't know whether it's a reality that, that you recognise as providers. Unfortunately, I can't see people nodding or shaking their heads because it's... Uh, it is a little bit dark out there. Again, going back to Joseph Roundtree, what we do know, and we see day to day in all of our test settings, be they residential care, be they domiciliary and home care, community-based services, that relationship between the service user and the frontline member of staff is absolutely pivotal. Absolutely, it's pivotal. But what I found interesting, of course, is that Actually, during the course of any one working day, a resident will have lots and lots of different contacts with members of staff. The morning shift, the afternoon shift, the night shift, agency staff, 
our own in-house bank staff, visitors. So during the course of the day, one resident will come across lots and lots of different members of staff. Um, I recently uh, sat in one of our care homes. Um, I just sat in the corner of one of the lounges and I tried to work out how many contacts one of our residents had with members of staff over a period of time. And I lost count after about 25. Some of these, some of these contacts were short, some were slightly longer, but there were a number of contacts during the course of the day that our residents were having. And these were with, with individual members of staff, as I mentioned, over the course of three shifts a day and others coming into the homes. And then I asked myself the question, so if you're a resident on the other side of that, what does that feel like? What does it feel like to have so many different people come into your life over the course of a single day, day in, day out? I also started looking at that interaction. And despite the fact that staff care, some of those staff, the contact didn't feel right from my point of view. So I started extending my thinking and came up with, with um, perhaps asking our staff to think differently about what they do, recognizing that their day is broken up into hundreds of, if not thousands of different areas of work during the course of the year, of, of, of the day. And of course, if you work a five day week or you work a shift pattern, that's hundreds of thousands of times over the course of a year. So what I'm hoping is that our staff will think differently about what they do and will start thinking about what I've described as magic moments. Some organizations are already thinking like this and described it as something else. But for me, it's about magic moments. I think about my personal situation when I, if I go to a restaurant or if I go to any kind of service provider, they're not with me all the time. If I go to a restaurant, it's about how I am served at that particular point in time. If I go to a shop, it's about how I am served at that particular point in time. And I'm asking our staff to think about magic moments, about the possibility that every contact they have with a resident or a service user, the responsibility is theirs to make that moment, however, however fleeting, as magical as possible. As I said, chances are within any residential care setting, and if you think about home care, it's slightly different, but the principles are the same. There'll be about 300 plus opportunities for our staff, whoever they may be, to create a magic moment for that resident. That equates to over 2,000 magic moments a week, 8,000 magic moments a month, over 100,000 magic moments a year. Now, if you're a, mem a member of staff, it's difficult to think that way, actually, because perhaps it puts you under too much pressure because there are times when you just really want to get on and do what you have to do. But the idea of creating, be it in a moment of personal care or a moment of supporting someone to have their breakfast, how can you as a member of staff make that moment magical, whether it's fleeting or over a period of time? It's about what it feels like. It's about the emotion that you put into that, that magic moment. And the question is, can our staff think differently about that? I hope they can. That's the challenge that I hope our staff can uh, rise to. I've spoken to staff and they've, they've said to me that actually they feel that's what they do. But on re then they reflect and say, well, actually, there are times when I'm just so busy, I'm just so stressed, I'm so tired, I miss opportunities. I don't make eye contact with the resident, perhaps. That, that, that physical contact that occurs perhaps could feel slightly different from the resident's perspective. The opportunity to see the reaction in the resident who's being supported, whether that is an event or whether that is just supporting someone to make a cup of tea in the morning or working with them doing some kind of activity. I think that's a challenge going forward. I'm not sure, given the current way that certainly residential care and to a degree home care is being developed, commissioned and run, 
it is possible to be absolutely person-centered all the time because of the way things are structured. So what I would like to think about is perhaps making the, the challenge much more um, acceptable, achievable for our staff. I'm hoping that uh, over time, and it will take some time, because I think the challenge that we face is supporting our staff to unlearn traditional approaches, unlearn ways of working. Earlier this week, we had a celebration success event, and we were recognized in long service, and there was a, a fantastic member of staff there who had 30 years of service working in social care. Not all for us, but within social care. We recognized her. What she's been asked to do today is very different to what she has been asked to do 10, 15 years ago. And I think we are confusing some of our staff by asking them to work in a particular way in an operating environment that they find ex increasingly challenging, supporting people with complex dementia in uh, residential settings and increasingly in the community. So what I'd like to do is to maybe just leave you with that as a thought that's a proposition, really, to ask you whether you have this experience in your services. I don't know which services you, you're from, whether you are commissioners or carers. But from my perspective, as an organization, in addition to doing everything else that we are doing, I'm hoping that we'll be able to get our staff to think differently about the interaction that they have with members, sorry, with residents on a day-to-day -day basis, residents and service users on a day-to-day -day basis. So far, the feedback from staff has been positive. They like that as a message. It's making them think. Um, and I hope that's where we can go as an organization over the years to come. And hopefully, as a sector, we can start thinking much more about magic moments in addition to all of the other areas of activity and work that we ask our staff to do. We know it's becoming more and more challenging out there. We know that resources are getting tighter and tighter. And our staff, I think our staff are looking for very simple and clear messages about what they do and, more importantly, how they should do it. So what I wanted to come along this afternoon to do was just share those thoughts with you. If I could stop sweating, that would be really, really helpful, but it's very warm up here. Um, if you've got any thoughts or ideas, I'd be more than welcome, more than happy to, to take them. Any questions you've got, more than happy to take those as well. I don't know, if, Andrew, if there is a microphone or, yep, yep. or whatever. Um, Thank you very much, Cedric. Can we just show a round of applause for the, so far? Thank you very much. I think Cedric's inviting you to join in a conversation. I think that's the way you phrased it. So we've got a microphone at the back. So who'd like to join in this conversation? Yes. If you could introduce yourself before you say. I'm Dr Llewellyn. I'm a GP. When you mention magic moments, are you... you um, Obviously, it's important to know that patient very well because that patient may, may sometimes um, not see this as a magic moment for that pe person or as a magic moment to them. They might see it as a um, affront or feel that they're not being treated um, well. So it's very important to know the full history of that patient. So have we thought of looking into that? Well, certainly in our operating environments, we will know our residents well through the care planning process, through the assessment process. Our staff will get to know the, our residents well. Sometimes I would suggest that maybe staff, our staff know our residents too well. And they, they, they know that Mrs. Smith always has a weak cup of coffee in the morning or whatever, and maybe won't ask Mrs. Smith how they would like their coffee in the morning because they've supported that person for, for many, many years. I also know that there's a view in some cases that contact is not a good thing between members of staff and residents. And I think that can be challenged sometimes because I think it is important. In terms of our philosophy of care, we talk about... Um, uh, supporting people in a way that they're comfortable with and that comes out of getting to know the individual and I think that's a real challenge where we have agency workers coming into our care homes sessional workers it takes them longer yes they read the care plans etc etc but it's a real challenge but my sense is having spoken to families some residents and some staff this is something that they're 
that they, they, they like the sound of. They like the sound of actually, if I break down my, my support of that person to this moment in time, this is what they feel comfortable with. So I think you're right in terms of understanding the person, knowing the person, but I also think certainly in our residential care settings, our staff do know the residents very well, but it's only a matter of asking staff to remember that in that moment, if they're supporting someone to get up in the morning or supporting someone to have breakfast, there is much more to it than just the task. There is about a connection that we're hoping to form with that person, however fleetingly. I'm not a clinician. I can't talk about the pathology of dementia and so on and so forth. But just for observation, I see how people react. People react differently depending on how they are being supported in that moment. Who's next? Yeah, at the front. It's, it's kind of like finding the real me, isn't it? I'm not a person. I'm not a cared for person. I'm, I'm, I'm me. Yes. And you engage with that person at that moment. Excellent presentation. I'm Councillor for London Borough of Harrow. I'm Councillor Marika. Uh, I have been a dementia support worker in uh, community. And I do understand you say in the care field that the staff can't be uh, very much care uh, to have the distance and not to have the care feeling and so and so forth. But you can't do it because I really know what happened to me. Uh, in a case uh, when she was taken to the hospital, she beat me when I was, uh, uh, gave her a bath. So why the care professionality says you can't get very close to the care because if the name is care, why can't we be care as a support worker or a carer? Well, I think it's an interesting perspective and of course what we're finding certainly is the level of challenging behaviour in our, in our residential care settings increasing all the time. There was a time of course where you know, people uh, in, in residential care were described as frail elderly, but increasingly residential care has been really the preserve of people with dementia. But my expectation is that through our training of our staff, their knowledge of the individual, the ability for them to notice, pick up the signs, they're able to manage that challenging behaviour in a, a non-aversive way. Despite all of that, my expectation is that those members of staff will still understand the individual to the point that during that moment where it is supporting somebody to have a bath, they will recognize the person, they will personalize the service insofar as we know that Mrs. Smith likes lavender bath oil and so on and so forth, but then they will provide that support in a way with compassion, with empathy, dare I say with love, in a way that connects with the individual. Now I'm not qualified to say whether that will dissipate the challenging behaviour, it may or may not, but generally speaking, challenging behaviour is, is a sign of something else and it's a way of communicating. So from my perspective, I think it's something that we can look at within this context. So what I'm suggesting is that over the course of any working day, if we have all the staff in our residential care settings who do come into contact with our residents, we can provide them with a much better service, much more appreciative and understanding service if we recognize every minute that we're with that person there's an opportunity there not a challenge there's an opportunity to create a magic moment thanks very much a question at the front thank you hello uh, my name is dania i'm a care home manager um, we have a 20 service user with challenging behavior uh, and mental health problems. I do agree with you. Um, training is, is something very important uh, when you you know working with the staff with people with challenging behavior. But also the recruitment process when you asking so, someone to come and work in your home, not just look at the minimum qualification that a carer can have. You know, if no, recognize that this this carer could be genuine and she really cares. Not just get any. You know, anyone that just got a minimum, you know, to just, just pay a little money, just recognize. Um, sometimes it is difficult because people, when, when they are uh, being interviewed, they just give you, you know, what, the best of them. But it's about recognizing if they're really genuine. And also, for challenging behavior, if someone comes to a setting that there are uh, service users with challenging behavior, I know you, you give them training, but also they need to recognize the risk that these people, one day you may get hit because they have mental health problems. You know, it's something, you know, sometimes you can't avoid. Uh, but as long as you give a training and, you know, the, the supervision, then, then you are doing the right thing. Absolutely. It all starts with recruitment. The ability to recruit, 
the right people. Um, and sometimes that's not somebody who's got 25 years of experience. It may well be someone who doesn't have experience, but actually their values, their intuitive sense of, of relationships is really what, what's, what uh, stands them out. It does, the expectation of all of us is that we will recruit the best people we can, the people who have the values that align with our values, with the way we wish to deliver care and support. Once we have those people, we will supervise them, appraise them, we will train them, we invest a lot in training. We expect to do all of that, and I'm sure everybody would expect us all to do that. But ultimately, it starts with the raw material. It starts with recruitment. And if you're able to recruit the right people, and in, bizarrely, at a time of high unemployment, recruiting the right people is not as always as, stra as straightforward as you might think. It's actually much more challenging than you might think, because we don't want people who just want a job. That's a challenge. So I, I absolutely agree with you about the need to recruit the right people and start the process in the right way, then you give yourself the best chance. Then it's about leadership of those people, it's about the role of the manager, we know how crucial that role is in any setting, and if we can get those, that right, we stand a chance. I think we've got time for one more question at the back. Sorry, I spotted her first, apologies. <laughs> Thank you. Again, could you introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Angela Fogo, I'm from Outlook Care, uh, Recovery and Activities um, Coordinator. I like very much what you said about this magic moments and creating magic moments, and it does work. I know from, from our experience as well. I'm working in a um, mental health unit. Uh, but I have a question about uh, how you support your staff. Because to the lady before she mentioned about the recruitment, and obviously during the recruitment process, everyone presents yourself in this beautiful light, and it's obvious that everybody wants to present yourself uh, and give the best, but later on during the work, the whole year work, uh, I think all of, all of us, we know that this is really difficult work, very challenging work, overwhelming sometimes, very stressful, and I, I'm always thinking about it, how, how can we support our staff to give them, uh, just to, to, to help, to, to give the hand, to, to increase the values, maybe how recognize them work. I know you mentioned already that you recognize the, the lady in uh, the 30 years of her job, but how can you do that? Uh, Thank you. I think it's a very really difficult, seconds, it's, Cedric, it's a difficult question to, to ask. Um, I think it very much comes down to the relationships that the manager can foster within the staff team, because it's not just about the um, vertical relationship between the manager, assistant manager, and members of staff. It's also about the peer support that members of staff get. We talk a lot about challenging each other and supporting each other. So for me, it's, not, it's, it's more of a, of a 360 type approach, which involves the residents and families to help members of staff. There's things, some, some things that we can't control, some things that we can't manage, but the things that we can control, I think our challenge is to work collaboratively to help each other move forward whether you're chief executive or a care assistant. Thanks very much. Cedric, um, it, the, as you said before, um, learn, challenge, but also business contacts. I think Avanti are on Q54. Thank you very much. So uh, carry on the conversation on Q54, but not till you've um, heard our next speaker. But can I ask you to thank Cedric for a very thought-provoking session? Thank you very much. Thanks very much. We're going straight into the next session, so we'll just turn around very quickly if we can. If you're staying, please stay. If you're going, thank you very much. Going, thank you very much. Going, thank you very much. Going, thank you very much.